Good morning. How is life today? Life is good, yeah. It's supposed to be good. Glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me here. And like you already heard, uh, the idea was to talk about my life. I don't know how you, <laughs> how you figure it out then afterwards. You have heard everything. But actually, why, why this topic then was that um, I have been uh, in FM industry or FM education actually for the last six years. In, I come from Finland, and, um, and, and um, I never had a single job in, in, in FM industry, never. And at least in Finland, they consider me a specialist in FM. And then I started wondering, hey, what is, what is this? But then actually, when I started going backwards my uh, work career, I noticed that actually all my life I've been doing FM. And that's one of the exciting things about FM. Uh, I also fell in love with service design some years ago, and I never knew anything, heard anything about service design before I, before I came to this university I'm working at the moment. And, uh, and then actually afterwards I noticed that I've been doing service design most of my life because my background is in service business. Then I went to one uh, conference in Lancaster in, in uh, UK. Uh, in a service design conference where I met uh, lots of professionals uh, in service design. And there I found out that I'm a non-designer. And then I started asking that, hey, why am I a non-designer? Because I'm teaching our students how to do service design. So I should be a specialist in service design. But no, 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 you don't have a degree in, in design thinking and design stuff. So that's why you are not a designer. You are a non-designer. Then I started wondering, OK, I don't have any degree in FM, so should I then be a, well, how do you say it, non-FM specialist or whatever? But this is one of the uh, th uh, things that I want to point out, that because FM is such a versatile thing, uh, such a versatile industry, and depending on actually who's talking, you can define FM in, in, in many ways. So the idea of this uh, presentation is to talk a little bit how I think about FM and how it has been, it has been connected with my life. And, and like I was just referring to, I have figured it out that uh, FM is almost anything. And that is one of the challenging things. So depending on who is talking, uh, FM is defined and will be defined in, a, in different ways. OK, that can also be said that that's a good thing, because when FM is about almost anything, then, then we are all FM specialists, actually. Uh, then uh, I probably talk a little bit about uh, sharing. Why about sharing? Because I have noticed that uh, through sharing your thoughts and sharing your experiences, you can learn a lot. And especially when you talk about FM, it's important because FM is such a versatile industry. We, it's not possible to know everything about FM. And through sharing uh, your experiences in, within FM, you will learn a lot and maybe get a little bit different types of approaches into, into your doings. So that's really important. Yeah, no, let's not go to toilets yet. Let's, uh, I'm going to be talking about toilets. So if you, if you remember something about this, uh, this presentation, it should be toilets, because toilets are really important ingredients when it comes to FM. Anyways, who am I? I've been working about 35 years, uh, in, 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 or more than 35 years, actually, in, in different positions, and about 25 years in management positions. There's a list of... Uh, uh, list of uh, positions that I've been involved. Uh, it has to do with hotel and restaurant management. It has to do with passenger ships. It has to do with municipalities, spa and rehabilitation business, and so forth. And in actually all those uh, all those places where I've been working uh, in toilets have been really important things. I also have some degrees. I have three degrees and working on one, but I think they are not important because it's more about skills and knowledge than degrees. So let's go to toilets. Uh, my first job was actually uh, in eastern Finland uh, on a camping site. I was, it was in, wait a second, 1976 or something like that. So 40 years ago, I started my career. And my job was to empty outside toilets on a camping site. 
And of course, then it was not necessarily the nicest job you can have, but, uh, but, but and I'm not going to go into details how to empty an outside, outdoor toilet. But um, actually, we learned then there also that even going to an outdoor toilet, it should be an experience. And uh, then we started figuring out, because the toilets in the camping site, they were really dull. And every once in a while, they were also rather dirty and stuff like that. Then we started thinking about how about designing a toilet. This is not the, the, the toilet that we designed, but I just found this picture somewhere and thought that this could be, for example, one of the ways to design a toilet. Think about yourself sitting there having a nice uh, newspaper or something with you, and then you have a nice view from the window to the lake, and then you just enjoy being in the toilet. It's really nice. So that was my first job, working on a camping site. And of course, you know, when, when we talk about Finland, Finland has lots of camping sites because they are most of the time on the lakes. We have about 80,000 lakes in Finland. And uh, so that's rather much water there. That's rather many summer houses that people have there as well. Actually, Finland, if you compare the size of Finland, for example, with the Netherlands, we have the Dutch gang there in front of us. So, um, so uh, you can fit eight Netherlands into Finland. And uh, we are five and a half million people in Finland, and in the Netherlands, how is it, 17 million or so. So they can compare the size. So most of the Dutch have been living uh, underneath the sea level, and we've been living above the uh, sea level and the lake levels all our lives. Okay, so toilets are important when you talk about FM, and actually my FM career started with the toilets. Then I moved to the Hogeland restaurant business. My first uh, job was uh, uh, working as a head waiter in, in Finland, and uh, the restaurant was called White Lady. And uh, there I bumped, bumped into lots of different types, types of logistical and catering stuff that also has to do with, uh, with FM. Then I went further. And uh, this uh, place was, uh, was in, is in Germany. It's in Würzburg. It's called Hotel Rebstock. It's still existing there. And I worked there also as a head waiter. And what I learned there concerning FM, that was owned to, uh, by an uh, elderly couple. And uh, it was a really fancy restaurant. We, uh, we set the tables with silverware and white cloths, of course. And every morning before the lunchtime, the lady of the house came in and all the waiters, we had to stand in line and we had to lift our, our pants so that she could see that whether we have the black socks there. We had to show our fingernails and, and uh, so that our hair was cut uh, uh, accordingly and stuff like that. So there I learned about German discipline. And actually discipline is very important when it comes to FM as well. So that was Hotel Rebstock. Then I went to pizza business. And what did I learn there? That was a restaurant downtown Helsinki. And uh, we were serving about 1,000 pizzas a day. And uh, of course, when you uh, produce 1,000 pizzas a day, it is also rather challenging, but also logistically, and also how to use the raw materials. It's really important. And uh, for example, we had one person who was weighing these seven grams of uh, cheese to, in a certain cups, which were then used by the pizza cooks, so that we had uh, always a specific amount of cheese on the pizza. Just think about selling 1,000 pizzas a day, and then you had one or two grams too much cheese on it. And then you end up calculating how many kilos per day it goes to waste and how much money it is. We bought uh, uh, all the, uh, all the uh, olives and, and, and mushrooms and all these types of ingredients in, in containers from China. So logistically, it was also very well planned business. Then from pizzas, I went to ski resorts. And there's a rather famous ski resort in southern Finland, which is this picture on the right-hand side. And there I was working as a restaurant manager, and that was a combination of a hotel business, restaurant business, leisure business, uh, you just name it. And there you started learning a little bit of that versatility of hospitality industry, actually. And why, I, why I'm saying that, uh, actually, we should, or what I'm trying to say as well is that we should not necessarily talk about facility management or facility 
service business, we should probably be talking about uh, hospitality business, because what is FM? It is hospitality. That's my point of view. Then we went, I went to uh, passenger shipping. This ship doesn't exist anymore. She was uh, taken to India some five years ago, and, and uh, was torn, uh, she was torn to pieces. And so she's not in traffic anymore. But many of you know this sh ship called Finjet, which was trafficking from Helsinki to Travemünde, Germany. And actually there I bumped into toilets again. And my job was, uh, was to, uh, the, the ship was just recently bought by another company called Cilia Line, which is now part of Tallink Cilia, which is one of the biggest uh, passenger shipping operators on the Baltic Sea in Scandinavia. And Celia Line wanted to put that ship into their sort of a service concept. And my job was to uh, try to uh, uh, try to sort of uh, commit the personnel to adapt this service thinking that Celia Line wanted to adapt into that. The background, the culture for the ship was it was owned uh, by a, a paper pulp uh, industry company called Enzo Goodside. Nowadays it's called Stura Enzo. And uh, of course, the culture on the ship was also like if you were in a paper pulp factory. And uh, all the peop most of the people working there were thinking that uh, our job is to take the ship from place A to place B, and everything which is on board the ship is cargo. Even the passengers were cargo. And that was the starting point for it. And then one day, we were on the, on the sea. And, uh, and, and the schedule was such that you were staying one day on the sea and two nights on the sea, and then uh, Tuesday evening you left from Helsinki, and Thursday morning you were in Germany. And we had a family with uh, three kids on board the ship, and during the day the toilet broke. And then we started, of course, calling to the engine room because the, uh, the uh, engineers were in charge of uh, all the uh, maintenance uh, on board the ship, even the toilets. And we called to the engine room and asked, that, hey, could you come and help us? We have this problem. Yeah, 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 we will come, but we have, we have here these engines to run. And they never came. And then we came to Thursday, and the family didn't have a toilet for 24 hours or so. And then we started thinking, how, how should we get rid of this problem now? And uh, then we figured out that the engine room had coffee breaks every morning at 10 and every afternoon at 2 o'clock. And then we decided with our management team that, OK, each of us goes to those coffee breaks in the engine room and starts talking to these people. And that was the first time ever on that ship that uh, the, the, the uh, service personnel goes to the engine room and drinking coffee with the engineers. And the first session was rather interesting. I was sitting on the other side of the table and the engineers on the other side, and we were just watching each other and drinking coffee and not talking too much, because that was an awkward situation, at least for them. And then little by little, we went in, and then we started talking about weather and all these types of things, and then we went into uh, talking about service. And it took us about half a year to do this until they understood that, OK, this is actually passengers who are paying our salaries. And then when something came up and we called, they came immediately. So what's the message in here? Uh, it's probably also that uh, working in FM, because of the versatility of, of, of uh, services, you also have to go a little bit beyond your organization and go beyond your people and understand where they come from, what kinds of values they have, what, uh, what kind of cultures or subcultures there are in the organizations in order to understand the behavior and according to that start making the change happen. And that was really valuable experience for me at least and helps actually rather much in understanding FM environment as well. So passenger ships were really Really, it was a really nice experience. Then I went to spa and rehabilitation, and actually there I bumped, bumped into toilets again. My first job in this company was to invest in a uh, waste plant uh, by this beautiful uh, spa in, in, uh, in central Finland. And that was investment at that time worth 5 million marks, which is less than 1 million euros. And, and, uh, 
but it had to do with uh, how to sort of utilize and handle all the waste that was coming from the toilet in an ecological way. So there again, I learned how important it is to maintain the toilets. What did I do then? Oh, then I went to work with the bears. And uh, actually, this is uh, from a municipality in eastern Finland. I was born there, and then I was asked by some politicians that, hey, how about we need a mayor just like you. You have to come here and work with us and get more investments and new jobs and stuff like that. And <clears throat> I thought, well, never. I'm never going to work as a mayor. Just forget about it. But then they kept coming and coming and coming. And then I decided, well, OK, I can try it. I rather easily get excited into things, and then I thought that, okay, let's go for it. Of course, uh, I had some ideas of uh, what kinds of uh, individuals uh, politicians are, but there I really learned how they are and what they are. And there I got interested in, in, in how this decision-making is being done <coughs> amongst <coughs> in different types of social groups, especially in political groups. And I'm talking now about party politics more, more than uh, politics, uh, politics in general. And, uh, and, and the way the decision making usually goes is that first comes the individual interest or benefit, then comes the uh, party interest or benefit, and then comes uh, some organization's uh, benefit, and in the end there is the taxpayer's benefit. And I thought that it should be the other way around, that first comes the taxpayer's benefit, and then everything else. And in the end, there's the individual benefit, if there's anything left. And actually, that's something that I think when we talk about, for example, networking, and uh, for example, in EuroFM, I think that this should be also in this way, that first comes actually not even the member's benefit, but the end user's benefit or the customer who is our customer, which we should serve when working within FM. And of course, you can say that, hey, we all do that, but I don't think so. We don't do that. Most of the time, of course, uh, it is about how we think that th things should be. In service business, there's this pit hole where you fall rather easily, is that you start thinking that you know better than the customer him or herself, what is good for the customer. And I think in FM industry, we have similar challenges as well. It's not only FM industry's challenge, it's in any business we have that challenge. And in the municipality, I learned that too. So the politicians deciding, and also the, the white collar people working for the municipality, they thought that they know better what is good for the taxpayers. Then what other things I learned there, I also learned that politicians have a rather long hand, as somebody said to me after I described the experience over there. Politicians have a long hand, what does it mean? So I noticed that, uh, that, that whatever you are doing, there's somebody in the backstage all the time doing something and guiding the processes or utilizing different types of social groups uh, for the benefit of somebody. And suddenly you notice that even though you were supposed to go to that direction with that decision, somebody has forced you to go to that direction. And uh, that's again an implication of that, that we don't necessarily think about the end user or the customer in the first place. It's about our own benefit. And that's one of the, ch one of the things I learned there, that in order to serve genuinely and authentically your customer, you have to step out from your own boots and go to that customer's boot, boots and then start thinking how to do things. Of course, then I also got interested there about these processes that are in the, in the background when talking about how social groups make decisions. And then I started studying it. And actually, I'm just working on a, on a research that has to do that how uh, social groups have, uh, have an effect into the decision making. And, uh, and there I, I learned uh, many things from a person called uh, Daniel Kahneman, which is probably uh, familiar to many of you. And uh, actually he got his Nobel Prize in economics in 2002. 
uh, even though he's a psychologist. He got a Nobel Prize in economics. And uh, one of the things what he did, he was, uh, he was going through di different with different types of methods how uh, American uh, companies made their investment decisions when they went to China. And one of his outcomes was that uh, actually uh, the investment decisions didn't have anything to do with profitability, but because everybody else was going to China, the companies also wanted to go to China. And then afterwards, many of them noticed that, hey, actually we should not have gone to China. I think about the similar uh, uh, phenomena is there when you go to a sale, for example, in a department store. You see a group of people uh, ga gather, gathered in a group and they want to buy, there's something interesting that they want to buy. And then you go there and see that, okay, if everybody else is buying that, I, I have to buy that too. And then you go to the cashier and pay it, and then when you get back home, you notice that you don't even need that thing at all, but you just had to buy it because everybody else was buying it. And there, that has to do with the different types of biases that we have. It's really, we really easily get biased when we see that other people are doing that stuff. Maybe I should also start doing that stuff. And one of the, uh, one of the uh, most dangerous biases is what uh, Kahneman and, and the other guys call uh, an anchoring bias. So we anchor our mind into certain type of thinking and we tend to sort of reject everything that is negative to that thinking, and then everything that is in favor for that type of thinking guides us uh, towards some kind of a decision. Just think about the uh, criminal series is in uh, what you get in TV, and you are in the court room, and there is the defender and the prosecutor, and the prosecutor always uh, has the only, only route that he has is to prove that that person is guilty and doesn't even think about the option that maybe he or she hadn't done that, what he's been accused for. But that's sort of an example of the anchoring bias. You anchor yourself into thinking that that person is guilty and then you do use all possible means in, when showing that he really is guilty. And that's dangerous stuff as well. And that's happening in real life as well. Then I got tired of uh, being a manager all the time. Being a manager for 25 years, it really takes juices out of you. And then I, I was getting also a little bit older. And uh, I thought that, hey, I, I want to do something that I'm happy with, I'm motivated with, and, and which is sort of uh, brings also a little bit different type of excitement into your life than managing things and people. I'm not saying that management uh, positions are boring or bad or whatever, but uh, uh, it's good to change every once in a while. There, there is uh, lots of research, uh, and one of them says that uh, if you have been working in a certain managerial position for five years, you start losing your creativity and losing lots of other skills. So all of you who have been working there for 25, 20 years in the same position, you should start changing your position because you have already lost lots of your creativity. And why I'm talking about creativity, you will find out a little bit later. Uh, I went to universities uh, then, in, it was in 2007, if I remember correctly. My first university where I was working uh, as a senior lecturer was in Lapland in northern Finland. You all know where Santa Claus lives, don't you? Where? In Lapland, yeah, by the, by the Arctic Circle, yeah. So uh, Santa Claus is not from Sweden or not from Russia, it's from Finland. Just like saunas. Saunas come from Finland, even though the Swedes say that they, are, they come from Sweden, but that's not true. So I went to work with Santa Claus people in Lapland. And the way I was recruited to that university was that I was in some party in Rovaniemi, in Lapland, and somebody came and asked me whether I speak English. And I said, yeah, I, I speak English. Then they said, could you start next week? I said, okay, I'll start next week. So that was the recruiting process for me. And then I started teaching. And uh, one of the funny things also was that there was this professor uh, who, of course, had a PhD, because all professors have to have PhDs. And I had o only bachelor degree in hotel and restaurant management and only an MBA from Henley Management College in London. 
but in Finland we are really sort of uh, safeguarding what is an, an equivalent uh, degree uh, which gives you an opportunity to uh, work in certain position. And because this MBA was not graded as the master's degree in Finland, according to Finnish system, uh, I was treated rather peculiarly. And I always remember this discussion with a professor when she was talking to me whether I'm uh, capable of teaching these leadership lectures, uh, leadership courses and stuff like that, because you don't have a degree. And I said, well, then you just give me, you asked me to come to work here, so you tell me what I teach and then I teach that. But then I was working on my master's degree in social sciences and uh, and uh, I was still working in that same university. And it was funny how this lady started treating me differently when I had my master's degree in social sciences. I was on the same level with her after. So then I started wondering, uh, what on earth is this degree stuff? That degree brings you the skills and capabilities of doing certain jobs. I think that's really funny in a way. So let's see what happens when I get my PhD. Wonder how they start treating me after that. Okay, then after uh, Laplatte, I heard from somebody that, hey, in Laurea, in Helsinki, there's this really interesting job. They are looking for a, a person who should be in charge of running a facility management degree program. And well, well, in interesting, facility management, never heard about it. But then I, again, got excited about that. And then I went there for an interview, and they said, okay, welcome. Welcome here. And that's how I got into facility management. And my first course was uh, sort of an introductory course for facility management. I went in to work there in September, and the course started in the mid middle of September. And uh, it was rather exciting to put that course together because I didn't have a clue what I was supposed to be teaching. And then I just started gathering stuff uh, around me, and then off we went. And actually, I got really good feedback from my superiors that, hey, you seem to be knowing rather much about facility management. And I said, well, I didn't know that, but thanks for telling me. And after, ever since, I've been in the, in the FM environment, and, and, and then we get rather close to the end of the story, but not the end of the presentation yet, so don't fall asleep yet. So then I got into these networks of uh, facili uh, facility management, I, and I think that's one of the essence and one of the most valuable things when it comes to FM, uh, FM community is this network and how to uh, sort of keep that network alive. Because I, of course, many other uh, disciplines and, and business uh, areas have also networks, but I think because of the versatility and, uh, and versatility of this FM industry, the network is, networking is really essential because it helps us understanding each other, it helps us sharing things uh, a lot uh, easier and so forth. And it doesn't have to be this type of face-to-face -face conferences always, they should be there because the, uh, uh, the social contact with people is one of the most important things when it comes to learning. And of course, it's a lot easier to share your thinking and, and things when you are in, in, in physical contact with people. And that's how I then got also into Finnish Facility Management Association. I'm at the moment vice president of the IFMA chapter in, in, in Finland. And of course, uh, Amsterdam or the Dutch, I, I, I used to say the Dutch Mafia is rather rather has a central role in, 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 in FM because uh, there's, of course, logical reasons for that because if you think about European education at the moment, I think, I think the Netherlands uh, have been there uh, for such a long time in, with this education that, that, that they have been able to bring lots of uh, different types of values and especially this people thinking that I think also is important. They emphasize that. Yesterday we had a group of university people together in another room here, and there we were talking uh, about different approaches into FM. And that's uh, also uh, really challenging, that uh, un uh, understanding the different approaches and also listening, and not only listening, but hearing uh, what the other representatives of those other approaches have to say and not only thinking that my approach is the one that one should adapt. So different voices in, 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 in our industry, that's 
really a uh, uh, important thing to understand why they are there and hear them, listen to them, and, and uh, appreciate them as well. Oh, it went fast. So, I was referring to the degrees. And of course, uh, if you think about my life story as well, uh, you can understand that I, I have learned la rather much uh, during that uh, path that I've been taking. And uh, of course, uh, certain types of skills they stick to you, and certain types of skills tend to be forgotten. And uh, and and reason why I took this list of skills, this is actually actually from the uh, the, the uh, World Economic Forum's uh, research on the future of jobs. And this uh, list is actually, it's listing the skills that were really important uh, in 2015 and which will be important in 2020. And my question now to all the, uh, well, it doesn't have to be FM people, but to any, anybody, is that have you really considered these skills? How about educators? How is your curricula? Has it been designed in such a way that you also consider that after those students who come in this year, they graduate probably in 2020, 2019. They should have these types of skills when they graduate. That should already be in the curricula of the universities. And the first one on top is complex problem solving. Think about FM industry and the versatility of it. And, and how you have different types of uh, actors in that FM game. You have end users, you have uh, clients, you have consumers, you have clients, clients, and so forth. And, and, and it really can be a complex process. Just think about a shopping mall manager, for example. We do lots of different types of development projects uh, with shopping malls in Finland. Uh, uh, Again, compared to other countries, I think Finland has rather a little bit too many shopping malls, but that's our nature. And uh, for example, the shopping mall that we are working with, they have about 23 million customers per year. It's just next door to our campus. And the shopping mall manager, actually, the job of a shopping mall manager is rather much similar to FM managers. The uh, building is owned by institutional investors, and they have uh, given the whole uh, building through a management contract to a company that operates the whole shopping mall. And then the shopping mall company that operates it makes all the contracts with the service providers, and that shopping mall, for example, has more than 20 different service uh, providers. And she has to, the, the director has to manage all that stuff. Not to talk about then the tenants that are, are uh, hiring the, uh, the shops there. Of course, then the customers as well. And the developments in, in shopping malls are going towards that direction that they are not anymore there for commercial purposes. The combination of services in shopping malls is uh, getting more sort of, a, it's a mixture of public and commercial services. And, and actually, the developments in shopping malls go towards uh, developing a community for people. For example, we made a research amongst uh, uh, youngsters from 15 to 20 years old and asked them that what kinds of shops would you like to have in a shopping mall? And they didn't name any. They said, we don't care what kinds of shops there are. We just want to have fun there and we want to socialize with other people. And actually, that's rather much similar to elderly people. There are lots of companies that have been trying to put up services so that you, just, you don't have to go to a grocery store at all. Uh, if you get old and a little bit crampy and don't like to walk to the shop and stuff like that. But actually those uh, services, they, don't, uh, they are not doing too well in Finland at least because the elderly people, they want to also to go and socialize with other people. They don't want to stay home alone. Critical thinking, that's another thing that is important in this list. And, and that's also, I think, uh, when working within FM, it's really, uh, actually, it's such an environment that it teaches you to think critically all the time, or it should, at least I have, I have experienced that in that way. So it, all the time, if somebody is doing something in a certain way, start not criticizing it, but also always questioning it. Why are they doing it in that way? What's the reason for that? 
And then the third one, which is really important, I think also is creativity. That's, for example, why I fell in love with service design, because it helped also me to p keep up with my creativity. I'm not the most creative person on earth, but still I think I have some sort of creativity there in the background. And then again, you can, if you put this into the FM context, think about the FM world with all these certificates and these types of things. Uh, what would you, how would our world be <coughs> if there was only one certification system and all the things would be certified with that system? That would be really boring, I would say. And just think about how, I'm not saying that certifications are bad now, just uh, don't understand me wrong. But uh, <coughs> when, you <coughs> when you start setting standards for things <coughs> in form of a certifi certificate, for example, so then it sort of guides you to, uh, to a certain way of doing things and a th certain way of thinking. And then you start getting blind to other ways of doing things. And then little by little you start also losing your creativity. Because you have one way of doing things because the certification system says that I have to do this in this way. And then you just do it in that way. And little by little your work starts getting boring because it's the same thing throughout the whole day. What else is there? Then there's one new thing coming in, into, this, uh, into this picture, number 10. Cognitive flexibility is not on the list when it comes to 2015. And well, what is cognitive flexibility? I think it's rather much, uh, uh, it has to do with this uh, complex problem solving as well. But I think it's very much attached to this, what Daniel Kahneman is talking about, getting, <coughs> getting biased and, and how to, how to uh, sort of a move around from different roles. If you think about your, <coughs> your own roles, uh, you are fathers, you're mothers, you're managers, you are members of different types of organizations and so forth. So you have many different roles. And I think cognitive flexibility has to do with this, that you, are, you really easily can change your role depending on the situation where you are at that moment. And what does it mean then for FM industry? I don't know, but uh, what does it mean for educators? Maybe we should think about it. But I think those were the most uh, important things that I, would, uh, I wanted to point out from these, these things. So, what are we going to do with this as FM people? in order to secure that we have those skills, because that those are, are already now in demand. Another thing that came to my mind when it comes to certifications was that, in, 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 and it has to do with these skills as well, is that we all know that uh, things about what's happening in the developments in, the, in 3D printing, for example. In Shanghai, they already have a block of blockhouse with many uh, apartments um, uh, made by 3D printing systems. How is it to maintain a building like that, done with 3D print printers? Have we thought about that in the FM industry? Is the main maintenance similar to how we maintain the buildings at the moment? How, uh, so maybe we should go to Shanghai and learn something about them as well. So, now we are getting uh, to the end of the presentation. So, what, uh, is there something to learn from this? I don't know, what do you think? But, uh, but what I have learned, anyways, I, I, I would like to share them with you, is that uh, we have this tendency to make simple things really complex and complicated. So I have had one of the uh, best bosses I have had was in Cilia Line, and he, he was, uh, he was uh, sort of a guy who always, he was an engineer. So maybe that was also one reason for that. But he always was talking about this back to basics. Uh, because service business on board the passenger ship, it's also rather sort of complicated and complex. So, but that was a really good advice. Because uh, I just read a book uh, from Daniel Goleman, who, is, uh, who has been talking about emotional intelligence and these types of things. And in his book, Focus, he's talking about this, how in the digital world, uh, our youngsters and those younger generations, how after being so much in, in the internet and using different types of devices, 
they start losing their focus. And that shows, in, in, for example, in education, when, I, when I'm dealing with the youngsters, it is challenging to, to make uh, the students to be, be focused for 45 minutes into something. And, and, and uh, there, this back to basics thinking is really important. And of course, keep it simple is similar to that. Staying authentic has to do also with this personal leadership uh, thinking. So after being 25 years in management positions, it's really important to set yourself aside and see the realities of different people. Uh, or it's at least easier to see them when you try to forget yourself. And al also being authentic, meaning that you don't start uh, sort of uh, copying things for, from it, uh, everybody else. Just stay as you are, and that's actually something that I learned, that don't try to pretend. For example, when dealing with the politicians, I learned that maybe in the best way. And first I started playing the same games with them, but then when I noticed that, hey, then I'm going to be in a really dangerous waters if I start doing things similarly like politicians do, then I I decided that, okay, I have to stay authentic. Understanding cultures, that you probably learned when, talk, when we talked about the toilet maintenance on board the passenger ships. It's really important not to only understand the cultures, but also the subcultures within organizations. Networking, especially for the FM industry, it is essential. And like I said, it's all about experiences. So actually, FM business, it's experience business very much, not only, only, only a uh, uh, service business. And in the end, this all is really challenging because there's a saying that, that uh, uh, we uh, don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. So we don't see things as they are, we th see things as we are. And this, again, has to do with this seeing different realities and stepping out of your own shoes. Uh, just for you as a, as a s sort of a reminder that there's been really lots of different types of wise people who have said lots of different types of wise things. And in the end, I, I just wanted to share these with you, how this simplify, making things simple and keeping focus has been important for many other people as well, or at least they have noticed that these complexities, they should be thought in a different way. It's Winston Churchill, Da Vinci, and so forth. I, I believe rather much in those sayings as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was all I wanted to share with you. I think that, uh, that we should do this sharing a lot more than we do, and it has to do also with these things that we tend to think uh, that we know things better than the other ones do, or we have difficulties to see things as they are. And uh, I would urge you to start sharing more, especially in the FM industry, and not only sharing, but also listening to all those manifold voices in the industry. Because if we don't do that, the, uh, the whole idea of the FM is going to might go down the, drain, down the drain of that toilet uh, because uh, in the end it's the end user, it's the customer that we should hear. And now when we have already challenges in hearing our voices within the industry, how on earth we can then hear the other voices. Thank you.